<laughs> well, welcome everybody um, to the Black Book Interactive Project Extending the Reach Scholar Program. First webinar, I need to hit record. Oh, somebody else hit record. Thank you, whoever did that. <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, I'm Sarah Arbuthnot Lent. I'm your um, Scholar Program Coordinator. I have emailed with all of you. I'm looking forward to meeting more um, face to face at one point <laughs> um, and getting to know you um, as we as we move forward. Um, I think we're going to start off with um, really quick introductions, just um, less than a minute so we can get moving on, on our program today. Um, and I think probably the best thing is to um, just wait until it's your turn and then unmute your mic and what you want to say and then and then mute again, then we'll minimize the feedback. Um, shall we start with the room of folks at KU since you're a big group? Okay, yes. Uh, so I'll be talking to you in a few minutes, but I'm Mary Emma Graham, project director for uh, the history of black writing and BPIP is, uh, is one of our, right now, a major project of HBW. I'm here at KU Department of English. Nice, nice to see and hear all of you. Hi, um, I'm Orlando Chakraborty. I'm a fourth year PhD student. I'm the project manager for BBIP, and uh, it's really exciting to see all of you today. And I'm, um, I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to get to know all of you better over the course of this week. Hi, I'm Aaron Wolf. I'm the metadata librarian at KU Libraries. I'm just sort of a consultant with the project. Uh, I'm Brian Rosenblum. I'm with KU Libraries as well and co-director of the Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities. We've uh, partnered and consulted with uh, this project and the History of Black Writing Project for a few years now. And seven. Seven. Oh, seven. No. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be working with uh, the group over this next year helping uh, consult and coordinate with the, the webinars and um, facilitating some discussions with, with all of you and your projects over the next year. So really looking forward to that. Thanks. Hello everybody, I'm Dana Shripora and I'm actually a digital humanities postdoc at IDRH. I work with Brian and I'm going to be coordinating one of the webinars in this series. So I think you will be hearing more from me later on, but excited to see how your projects shape up in the course of this program. And we have two of our advisors joining us. You wanna introduce yourselves? Yes, I'm gonna throw it, I'm gonna throw it to Monica first. She has okay. to step out pretty soon. Okay. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Monika Rue. I'm director of the James B. Duke Moore Library here at Johnson C. Smith University. And I'm also the board chair for the HBCU Library Alliance. Um, I welcome all of you. I look forward to learning more about your project and also extending any of my expertise to some of your projects if you need me as well. Um, thank you, um, uh, Ken State, for um, allowing me to be a part of this project. And I look forward, once again, working with everyone. Okay. Thanks, Monica. Thank you for being early, and we're sorry. We didn't <laughs> That's okay. You. Thank, thank you. you. As always, yeah. So, All right. Bye bye. Okay. Kenton, you're somewhere there. My bad. Am I here? Can you hear me? You're here. You're on now. Oh, okay, great. Okay, great, great. Hi, I'm Dr. Kenton Ramsey, um, assistant professor of African American literature at the University of Texas at Arlington. Did I? You're fine. You're fine. Just max out the I think Ken can start introducing himself. Is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll thank you, Sarah. I just want to say hi to everybody. We want to hear from you. Thank you for joining us and please tell us a little bit about yourselves and let me just say welcome at the outset to Dr. White hasn't Oh has he come in? Oh Roy, right. okay. I didn't see you up there. They got too many images on the screen here. Okay, Roy, right. thank you. And also our assistant. Yeah, uh, we'll go, I'll go ahead. Um, I'm Hoyt Long. I'm here at University of Chicago, uh, co-director of the Textual Optics Lab, which has been working with uh, the HBW and the BPIP project for a number of years now to sort of work on building out the digital side of things and the digital collection. And I'll be 
hosting part of the webinar today. And I'm uh, really uh, happy to meet all of you. Look forward to working with you on your projects, which I read through the applications this week. And it's, it's really exciting to, to be able to sort of connect you guys with this uh, fantastic collection. Uh, and I'm joined here uh, with uh, one of our research assistants, Nia Morrison. I'll, I'll let her introduce herself. My name is Nia. I'm a second year undergrad at U Chicago. Um, I'm the research assistant for the project, so I've been looking over the scans and helping prioritize when they'll be uploaded into the database. Nice to meet you. I hear you're a Georgia girl. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I'll be back on soon. <laughs> so now we're ready to hear from each of you who have given up your time to do the application and we really welcome, welcome your board. So please introduce yourselves and tell us something about yourself. We can start with Conrad. Conrad, okay. Hi, I'm Conrad Piggies. I'm a librarian at Tennessee State University and I'm also connecting myself. Vanderbilt has a digital humanities project going on, so I'm slowly incorporating myself into their project as well okay. with some different things. So, and working on MFA and creative writing, so this helps back up my MA in literature. Thanks, Conrad. Keep going. Sarita. Sarita, you're next. Hi, I'm Saritha Williams, and I am a professor of English at Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, I'm also a uh, MLIS student at the time. I know I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of masochistic in this way, trying to teach and also uh, take classes, but I'm super excited about this opportunity and look forward to uh, learning more and working with everyone. Thanks, Alicia. All right, and let's keep going. I'm one question. Uh, hi, I'm Rochelle uh, Spencer. I'm interested in, um, I'm on, uh, just defended a dissertation, and I was really excited to hear Augusta, Georgia, and because that's my hometown, or and Oakland's my adopted hometown. But um, I'm finishing up. Um, uh, dissertation work on um, uh, the idea of Afro-surrealism, and I'm really excited about this project and what it can offer. I think it's an amazing, amazing um, premise. All right. A lot of Augusta, Georgia folks in the house, it seems. <laughs> okay, keep going. If it's a matter of just jumping in, should we just- Yes, jump please. In? Okay. Yes, jump in, please. So, hi, everyone. My name is Megan goins Juf. I'm the reference archivist at the University Archive at Bowling Green State University. So we're in Bowling Green, Ohio. It's about 10 miles south of Toledo, 75 miles south of Detroit, which is my hometown. I'm a graduate of Howard University, uh, New York University, Africana Studies, and Long Island University in Library and Information Science. Um, and for my particular proposal, I'm interested in partnering with the Charles Wright Museum, the African American History Museum in Detroit, and digitizing some of their holdings. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> I'm happy for you to be here too. Jump, jump in. Jump out. I'm going to jump in here. Yes. Um, I'm Dr. Jacinta Saffold. I am a, a Mellon ACLS Public Fellow in Washington, D.C., where I serve as the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Student Success at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. I received my Ph.D. from the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I also am a proud Midwesterner. I am from, originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Anybody else jumping in? Hi, everybody. I'm Joyce White. Um, I am a PhD candidate at Clark Atlanta University, so more Georgia. Um, I'm coming to you from Savannah, Georgia today, so we got all of Georgia represented. I'm really excited uh, to be a part of this uh, project. I'm finishing up uh, my dissertation on Edwidge Danicott, so um, I'm getting a PhD in humanities. Uh, with concentration in African American uh, studies. So this is right up my alley and I'm just uh, happy to be here and getting ready to get to work with you guys. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, I'm Serena, uh, a, uh, currently at Northwestern University. Uh, I am a Chicago native. Uh, so at Northwestern, I am doing a 
two simultaneous degrees. I'm doing an MFA in uh, my focus is creative nonfiction and an MA in English Lit. Um, I did a MA um, also in Chicago and Paul in um, writing and, and publishing uh, and a while ago uh, a, a BA at Selman College, so more Georgia <laughs> there. Oh. Um, so I write fiction and uh, nonfiction. I'm also um, really specifically um, interested in the role of uh, the artist and, and writer as um, archivist, right? So not only through their work, but also kind of the responsibility of the artist to um, kind of like um, elevate the importance for um, historical record. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Eliseo Jacob from Howard University. Um, so I'm in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. Uh, my research actually is on Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Latin American literature, um, but I'm partnering with Dr. Del Sol here from the English Department. Uh, we're doing a project comparing kind of the interactions between African American writers and Afro Latino, Afro Latin American writers um, throughout the 20th, 19th, 20th century. Wonderful, thank you. My name is Marina Del Sol. I'm an ethnographer and I teach in the um, um, English department at Howard University. I work with the first year writing program. And I'm also going to be doing some work with the first year experience librarian and digital Howard with our project. Okay, great. Aisha Thompson. I am the digital humanities postdoc at Virginia Tech. I am going to work with the collection to do a summer institute, a digital humanities summer institute for Virginia HBCU students, community college students, and students who are at um, smaller universities in the state of Virginia to come to Virginia Tech for a week to work with the collection. Wonderful. Okay. All right, you're almost there. Hi, everybody. My name is Ebony Perro. I'm a PhD candidate at Clark Atlanta University uh, in humanities with concentrations in Africana women's studies and English. And I am wrapping up my dissertation about representations of angry black girls and black women's fiction. So I'm really excited to work on this project. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Sarah Meese. Um, I'm the Digital Humanities Assistant at Virginia Tech. So I work on um, outreach initiatives. I work with faculty and staff and just kind of anything DH related. Um, my background is in English and political science. So I'm really excited to be involved in this project and look at how um, political attitudes affect uh, different pieces of writing. Thank you for joining us. Couple more people. Hi, I'm Susan Lieber. I'm the postdoc in the English department um, and also work in ethnic studies at the University of Oregon. Um, I think I named three or four different projects I'm interested in working on, uh, so I'll be interested in hearing from folks about which sounds most promising. My work is on 20th and 21st century African American literature and other, its engagement with other media like film, photography, and music. It's nice to meet you all. Yes, thanks Susan. Denise, I know you're trying to jump in. <laughs> um, you, can't need hear to, you need to click on the unmute button. Unmute, okay, unmute. Okay, you got it, okay. It, oh, you can hear me, yeah, yeah. I'm a Jayhawk and I'm in yes. Alabama at Tuskegee uh, in the English department. Um, and um, I am really excited about this, I feel pretty lost when it comes to the digital humanities. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot. I have the wonderful bibliography that you shared with us and I'm about to um, bite into it. And I look forward to meeting um, everyone soon. Okay, welcome home, Denise. Thank you. Okay, did we, did we get everybody in there? Seems um. like Okay, April, all right. April, April Pennington? Is April, April Pennington? I don't think April's there. So that's the only person? And so Kirsten. And, and Ro Ro Rochelle. Rochelle Spencer? I see Rochelle there. Oh, you see. I mean, I see her listed on the oh, right. Oh, you see her listed. We can't hear her. her. Yes. Oh, yeah, Rochelle spoke. Rochelle mm -hmm. did speak. Um, okay, did we hear her? We don't see her, but. Okay, okay, Rochelle. Uh, so April, we don't have, and Kirsten Scott. 
Kirsten is traveling today and she wasn't sure she'd be able to connect. So. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for uh, introducing yourselves. Um, I'm just going to give you just a brief um, um, where we are moment, <laughs> uh, sort of how we got here, but I also want to put everyone at ease in terms of we're all in learning mode. Everybody around the table, everybody who you're looking at on the screen, we're all in learning mode. And so please feel very comfortable to stop anybody in the middle of anything if things are not making as much sense as you think they should. Um, and I want to say that in the context of the project that you have entered into is actually 35 years old. So you can see that we've been doing stuff a long time and we're still trying to get it right. And so we thank you for being part of the process of sort of getting it right and moving it to another stage so that it is accessible, which was our goal from the very beginning, to be able to have a research archive that people could work with uh, without the limitations of access um, and um, um, just familiarity of with, with, with procedures that one could use. So fortunately, we've been out here long enough for, I guess, in a sense, for DH to catch up with us. We're still trying to catch up with it, but it's also catching up with us. And so I, I want to especially thank the team of people you've heard introduce themselves today, Dinashri, uh, Brian, Aaron, Arnab, Sarah, um, who have uh, been uh, you know, on the ground here, Hoy, especially who came to our rescue, but we were not sure how we could take this step forward. And I want to especially give a shout out to Kenton, who is here, because this project, I said, was seven years old, and Kent was there at the beginning. Um, doing the um, pilot work, that pilot project that got funded locally before we got external funding. So thank you, Kenton, publicly for your good work. And you see what you did. <laughs> got us in trouble here. Uh, so BPIP, the Black Book Interactive Project, I'm going to let uh, Arnold talk a little bit more about it. But I just want to give you a sense of how we got here uh, from 1983 to now. Basically, we, we set out to find every single novel written by a Black writer. Ambitious, right? Well, I was just out of grad school, so you can be ambitious you know, and unrealistic when you're first out of grad school. Everybody knows that, right? So we were going to find every single one that existed, and it was a wonderful project because any age agreed with us. We needed to consolidate a database, and it had, we were not using the, the DH language in 1983. We, were using, we did use the word database. That's just pretty pretty sophisticated as we got. We were going to create a database. Um, and that database was essentially a list, a, a, a bibliography, but it, but it was in fact online. It was available online as opposed to, you know, in print. Uh, so that project we thought was going to take a very short period of time, but it took a lot longer. Um, and at, at this point, we probably have about 1,200 of the novels that we gathered at that point. And now when I say this, clearly there are more novels written by black writers, but a lot, most of these novels are not the best known, are not the best known novels. And the ones that you would not have access to because of that fact. So we did the, 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 you know, the hard work of finding them in the library loan someplace and making copies of them so that we would have at least one copy of the novel that nobody knew about. Uh, and so at this point, we could probably not even go back to those places that had copies because they don't exist anymore. But because we now have the digital archive, they do for us. Uh, so, so that was, uh, you know, the, the start of this project. Uh, but lots of other things began to happen in the meantime. And so I'm glad that we've been able to come back to a project that sort of took on a new name. It was the Afro-American Novel Project at one point then the project on the history of black writing because we began to do more professional development work and more public programming. And then um, uh, thanks to Kenton, we came back to this notion of the black book interactive project, which, which is where we are today, giving it a sense of, of, uh, of place, its own name, its own space, uh, so that it's connected to HBW, but it also, we know will grow on its own and perhaps will outstrip its capacity to stay within HBW, we don't know. But in any case, uh, so we're in our second round of funding. Uh, we got NEH to do a planning grant that helped us to develop the metadata schema. And we're still sort of segueing out of that project. And then we got the ACLS a grant funded by Mellon uh, into which you are now, or into which you are involved as BPIP scholars. And so the name has stayed the same, but we're on the second round of funding. Um, I think, 
I think I'll stop there and let Anna give you a little bit more particularly. Anna is our project manager. Uh, we have one other person joining us, Hamza, who's in class right now. So uh, I'll finally just say, as you can see, we're everywhere. We've got people here. We've got people, you out there. We have a Chicago, University of Chicago team. Uh, so we're sort of everywhere. And so we're taking advantage of this, of this time, the webinar time, to really uh, connect more clearly and actively uh, so that when you're doing your work, you don't feel like you're just out there alone. Uh, so we hope that these webinars will be useful. Uh, and if the plan we have is not working for you, please jump in and tell us that. Uh, Sarah is your primary contact in terms of keeping up with the mail flow and all of the communication. Uh, she is expert at what she does. Some of you know her already because we've been doing summer institutes for so long that she also manages. Uh, but uh, I just, again, let, let me turn this over to Arna, who is our project manager. And thank you again for hearing a little bit about the background for, for the Black Book Interactive Project and Project Management Black Writing. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to very briefly run through some of the work that I've been doing. Uh, I've been associated with this project for the last two years, two and a half years, and uh, I've been intimately kind of gotten acquainted with the process of gathering metadata, uh, with, with the collections, and I'll just uh, run through some of the goals of BBIP and what we have achieved so far and what some of the problems were that we faced um, in, in trying to kind of get to where we are today. Um, I will be sharing a presentation. Um, you should be able to see it. I'll just share the screen. Um, Can you let us know if you see it? Somebody says no. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. okay. Marina, you can see it? Okay, good. Okay, but I can't see anyone else. I guess I'll only be able to see all of you if I click on stop share, which I'm not going to do. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I'll keep this really brief because Dr. Wong will be presenting. That's somebody's phone. Um, somebody calling in? It's someone. I'll just briefly click stop share to see if someone's calling in. Um, no, I don't think so. Was that somebody's phone? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Well, we're back. Anyway, back to the PowerPoint. Um, so let's just share the screen. And um, okay. So um, I'll quickly. So Dr. Graham told all of you about uh, the history of HBW and BBIP. I don't have much to add there aside from the fact that um, we received NEH funding in 2014. And um, initially, uh, Dr. Graham had identified around 450 um, uh, really obscure novels that uh, uh, the people, our partners at the University of Chicago helped us digitize. But then that collection has grown to over 1,250. And um, right now, the primary goals of DBIP, uh, as it stands today, are threefold, and they are Basically, it wishes to expand upon how we think of African-American literature in DH by focusing on including texts which have been historically marginalized, but which might change the way we look at the canon. Um, it has developed a metadata schema that accounts for the nuances of race in the African-American novel. And lastly, it wishes to make DH more accessible to the general academic public by fostering collaborative networks and opening up its archive to DH projects, which is where all of you come in. Um, over the course of working for this project, however, I came across at least two concerns personally, which kind of framed the conflict for me, I think. Um, the first one was how best to kind of let the marginalized texts, as it were, breathe. Um, how to foreground the contradictions that these texts represent as not exceptions, but details which the canon kind of renders invisible or margin or, 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 or really um, naturalizes away. Um, I wanted to see how we could better represent those contradictions uh, that these texts were talking about. And two, how to not construe is issues of race, gender, and class as being too messy or subjective once they were incorporated inside an archive, because sometimes that messiness and subjectivity is part and parcel of what we are working with. 
So it, it's a crime to kind of ignore that when we are using the age to collect, kind of collect information. So, and Amy Earhart, uh, who I don't think is with us right now, but Amy Earhart talks about this and I quote, she says that without careful and systematic analysis of our digital canons, we not only reproduce antiquated understandings of the canon, but also reify them through our technological imprimatur. Um, one of the books in our collection had an introduction that kind of really, really framed this really nicely for me. It's a book by, called The Homian by Frank Yerby. It's, it's one of his last novels, I think. And, and there was a quote there that I'd like to kind of, um, I, I'd, I'd like to kind of mention here because it, it framed it so well. And Yerby says that in his introduction, slavery is a subject about which I hold violent and passionate opinions. And violent and passionate opinions are usually the death knell of good writing because they tend to automatically reduce an art form the novel, into a propagandist exhortation, a set piece demonstration of the author's personal dialectic, or a self-indulgent wallow in the amorphous mud of polemics. But this time, I honestly don't think they did. The reason they didn't is that accidentally, I had hit upon a subject about which violently and passionately is the only legitimate way to feel. So this, I, I found this quote really illuminating when I was working with the collections because I think one of the goals of BBIP is to represent such inherent contradictions and, 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 and paradoxes in black literature more comprehensively than it has been so far in the digital realm. Issues pertaining to race, as we all know, transcend simple categories involving bibliographic detail and biographical data, and often need a more theoretical grounding, geographical and spatial understanding of literature. And part of the difficulty lies in how black literature has come to be seen as primarily advocacy focused or as protest literature, severely narrowing the perception of what it has been and can be capable of. But this difficulty has been heightened due to the limited focus on some influential canonical texts. And one of the goals of BBI is to increase the visibility of lesser known authors. So these are just four examples of the authors. So we have Saturn E. Graves, who wrote Imperium and Imperio. It's an early utopian novel. We have Pauline Hopkins, who used the genre of the romantic novel to talk about serious issues pertaining to, 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 to racial, racial tensions when she was writing. We have William Attaway, who wrote Blood on the Ford. It's an early example of an ecologically conscious black novel. And we have Frank Yerby, who at one point, who I think, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, he was the first African-American novelist to sell over a million copies. Um, also from Augusta, George. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. So, um, so these are typically, I mean, um, not, you wouldn't come across these names unless you were a scholar in specifically African American literature. Um, so, one of our goals would be to kind of illuminate and foreground some of the work that people, uh, that authors like them have done. Um, the second goal is to expand the number of categories to include those which can both balance objectivity as well as make amends for the kind of data that do not fall under niche tags. Vivek wishes to ask, how do we go about quantifying black humanity in a way that renders it a plural intersectional concept without dehumanizing experience as mere data? So what are some of the ways to better render complexity? Um, as you can see from the screenshot, these are around 44 categories that we culled from archives which were already available digitally. Um, and these are pretty standard. They have bibliographical data and, and biographical data and publishing data. These are the three kind of major sections in which we kind of divided them. But we tried to intervene uh, in, in ways that kind of better represented complexity. So, um, some of the some of the things that we came across, some of the problems we came across. For instance, we asked ourselves, what if a novel by an African American author had no black characters? In it? What about the constant need for apologias that we face novels? What if you set out to write a book in the sentimental vein, appeal to reader emotions, but did not want to offend those who might possibly help your cause? What about the genre of the slave narrative? Once its need disappeared, did it still subsist structurally? in some unconscious or conscious fashion. So how do we go about representing these in our database, in, in our metadata? These are all potential gray areas which needed a more perceptive theory in which stance than what was currently available to us. 
What BBIT was not, however, or is not, is it's not meant to be an exhaustive research option. Um, it's not static, it invites additions and edits, seeks to constantly expand its categories, and it's not, like I said, purely biographical or bibliographical either, not averse to widening our notions of what racial emphasis might mean in literature, expanding it beyond the level of advocacy or restricting it to liberatory impulse alone. So very broadly speaking, and I'll keep this short, some of the categories that we started it, that we identified were around six. So themes and subjects. Typically, African-American novels are considered to be liberatory narratives, but does this apply to the larger canon as a whole? Fictional geographies. Where does the action occur? What kind of characters populate the novels? Where do they come from? Where are they going? Language, stylistic, and narrative features. Various speaking voices, diverse genres made use of often within the same text, contrasting political views, author information, aside from Usual bibliographical detail, it helps to know at what age the author was when the novel was written, what kind of schooling the author had. And the publishing process, um, many texts were self-published at one point as a way of countering exclusionist strategies. While now the atmosphere is considerably more different, publishers are also willing to take far fewer risks. So mm -hmm. that's another kind of thing that we try to consider. Uh, the last thing I want to run by all of you is how we extended, what were the categories that we extended our current metadata to and how did we extend it. So we started with author and we asked how did some of the other professions of the author in question influence his writing. Uh, a large number of authors on our list were engaged in a bewilderingly large variety of professions we felt needed addressing. How did this lend itself to an analysis of the protagonist's profession? in the novel. Connecting those two together, it would be better possible, we thought, to distinguish the areas where an explicitly autobiographical reading was possible. And returning to our starting emphasis on the author, we looked at how he or she was instrumental in introducing a theme or topic that had not been as crucial to African American writing or American literature in general. From there, we thought about notions of what was popular in a given decade and what wasn't. How did the presence and nature of certain themes tie into this popularity? And this is a particularly difficult category to quantify or represent. Uh, we're still struggling with this uh, one. Um, lastly, some of the ways in which um, to connect, we try to connect a work with a larger literary conversation. Um, taking place was looking at major and minor influences on such a work. Often an author would change genres drastically from one book to another. Why did this happen? How did the book reviews correspond to such a change, if at all? Where are the reviews published and where they published before or after the actual publication? And the last one, all of these tie into another problematic category, to what extent was the author invested in questions of race? Where do we pinpoint the investment and where do we draw the line? Um, these are some of the problems that we faced and we are still struggling with when trying to quantify uh, all, all of these, all of this, uh, all of this data. Um, the first one was we couldn't obviously, so we did a representative list of 75 texts and obviously we are trying to use the whole 52 categories that we came up with for our whole collection of 1250 and that's like a massive, uh, massive undertaking. Uh, but we obviously couldn't do a close reading of the texts. Um, refining the category of vernacular. Currently, we have a presence of vernacular, yes, no, but then we'd like to know what the different dialects are. How do we go about kind of uh, uh, specifying those dialects? Delineating between genre and theme and style and tone, gauging the popularity of a book in any given decade, confirming whether the first edition of a given text was in hardback or paperback, identifying specific rhetorical and linguistic features pertaining to any given text, and lastly, the fact that metadata extraction is not an exact science, it's time intensive and dependent on how obscure or popular a text might be. So I'll just end it right there, and um, I'd be happy to take questions that you have, but I'd like to kind of let Dr. Long uh, take it from there, uh, and I'll stop sharing the presentation. And by, by the way, all of this will be available to you to review 
at your leisure, so don't worry about trying to you know, take copious notes at this point. We will upload all that stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Graham, I think we can have Dr. Long. Continue. So, Hoy, you want to take it from here? Yep, uh, happy to. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, and before I do that, I'm going to give you all a link to uh, the PowerPoint, which is up on Dropbox, in case you want to access it um, that way. Should give you a link to uh, the, the PowerPoint slides. Let me share. Can everybody? Hold on. I accessed it fine. Yeah, we can we can see it. Okay. okay everybody see that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. So uh, I'm going to spend, uh, I guess, uh, just about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, and the main goal of, of what I want to get across to all of you today is, is really just introduce you to this uh, search interface that we've built here at Chicago for the first uh, 450 or so novels that have been um, fully digitized. Uh, so what I'll do, uh, you know, before I get to the, the actual search interface, uh, I want to spend most of my time with that, but I'll, I'll introduce you just a little bit more to the collection, uh, how we created it, uh, the, the process of, of digitization. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, introduce a little, uh, some concepts, uh, you know, rel that are relative to text mining, um, and things that I hope will help you to think about, you know, how you might engage with the, the corpus as such as it is, uh, you know, using some of the tools that uh, text mining provides. Um, talk a little bit about sort of what the tool does, you know, as in a kind of a advancement beyond just a simple keyword search. And then I'll go through essentially what the, the main functions of the tool are. So it offers a way to keyword search, of course, but it, it allows us to do some more complicated things. Uh, look at keywords in context, look at collocations, which is to say sort of what words tend to appear together in similar sentences, uh, frequency of word use over time within the collection, and then also, uh, if I have time, I'll introduce you to uh, another aspect of the, the search interface that allows you to look for the reusage of similar sequences of words. Uh, in the focus. Uh, I'll, I'll end with just a few notes about sort of what the tool is good for, how, you know, what it can provide you in terms of sort of thinking about your projects uh, and what it may, what some of its limitations are. Uh, and I'll, I'll also introduce at the end some other Textual Optics Lab collections that I think will be of value to you all uh, based on your research interests. So um, let me uh, first sort of introduce uh, the corpus itself. Uh, one of the first things you want to do before any kind of text mining project is really get to understand kind of what the data set is that you're working with. Um, and so I want to run through uh, a couple of things. First, you know, how, how did we create this? Uh, Dr. Graham has told you about sort of the, the history uh, of the project and the, the sort of the digital prehistory of it. You know, existed mostly as print copies or photocopies. Uh, here at Chicago and, and then later at Kansas, we began to digitize those texts with a, a high-grade book scanner, uh, which allowed us to create, you know, very high-resolution scans uh, of the images. Uh, from there, we ran these through um, an optical character recognition software called Abbey, uh, which is a CR software. Uh, some of that was automated, uh, but a lot of the a lot of the text presented sort of challenges in terms of their print quality or um, their typography. So, so those were done both with the software and with hand checking. Uh, and then we've converted those to plain text files. Um, just to give you a sense of that process visually, so here's the original scan of a, of a novel by Al Young called Snakes. Um, here's some more sort of prefatory, pref prefatory material. A lot of this, uh, you know, unfortunately, in the process of moving it to plain text, uh, is is cut out. Uh, our main focus, you know, we, we do have a version of the original archival scan, but for the the process of, for the search interface, we've really focused on just cutting out the main text. Um, so, for example, you know, with the OCR software, we'll eliminate uh, a lot of the heading material, uh, chapter titles, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so I just want to sort of mention this, that you know, some things do get lost in the process, but uh, hopefully you, know, you can always go back to the original scans. 
Uh, from there, we digitize it, and then it looks like this, a very uh, unappealing kind of raw text. Um, but we've preserved a little bit of information, sort of the paragraph breaks, for example, or uh, kind of the justification. You can see where uh, the words get hyphenated uh, due to the, um, the page boundaries. Uh, and then this is ultimately kind of cleaned up a little bit and turned into what I'm gonna show you later, this is sort of the text as it looks like in the search interface, where you can see that we've preserved some things like the paragraphs, but also uh, cleaned up the hyphenation so that those are removed. Uh, so, because that's not good to search for half of, you know, a half of a word. Um, I'll come back to this, uh, this search interface, but this just is really to give you a sense of kind of, you know, a lot, a lot of work is involved in moving these texts from uh, their print versions to their digital versions. Some things get lost, but what we gain is an ability to sort of search through them uh, at a, a larger scale. Uh, Arnab has talked a little bit about the metadata creation, um, and essentially all of that metadata sits in an Excel file um, right now, which looks something like this. Uh, each of the texts that we have is given a unique ID number, which you can see here. Um, and we use that unique ID then to link every text with its metadata. So here we only have, you know, what's a limited selection of metadata, author, title, publisher, and publishing place. But sort of behind the scenes, what's happening is that we're able to link every text through this unique, unique ID to the metadata we have. And that metadata will grow, you know, based on um, what's happening in Kansas, but also based on your contributions uh, to the project. Let me um, go ahead and move into uh, a discussion of the corpus itself. And I want to just pause a little bit to uh, sort of give us some terms to think about, you know, what is what this collection really re represents uh, against you know, some notion of, of what's out there and what's available. Uh, we can think of the published sort of world as every, all literary works that are available in history. Um, and then we have the archive, which is essentially what's been preserved of, you know, of everything that was written, preserved whether in our print form or in digital form. Um, and then below that is, is the corpus, which is some kind of subset or portion of the archive that's been selected out uh, either, you know, for digitization or for a particular research question. And so I think, you know, with all of your projects, the task is really to decide on uh, if you want to pursue a kind of a text mining project is to decide on what that corpus is uh, and how it uh, sort of connects back to uh, everything else that, that might be available. Um, I'm going to uh, just raise a few quick questions here. I want to make sure we have enough time to go through the tool, but you know, one of the things that uh, is important to keep in mind as you, with any text mining project is that the corpus, it, it becomes kind of the object of analysis, but in doing so, a lot of assumptions um, have to be um, made to treat it as a kind of an object that one can analyze. Uh, and so as you're thinking about, you know, the kind of corpus you wanna build or what it is you're actually searching through, it's important to think, you know, what what do you imagine that corpus to represent? Like what what part of the literary system do you imagine it to represent? Um, and what kinds of things get lost, you know, in treating a corpus as a kind of holistic entity? Um, I think a lot of the dynamics of how we think of what a text does or is and how it lives, its social life, that, that sort of gets um, that uh, those aspects get downplayed, um, and so you know, in the process of any kind of text analytic project, it's, it's important to sort of think about how you might build those social, spatial, or temporal relations back into the kind of work you do. Um, and hopefully, you know, in explaining the tool, I can give you some ideas about how to do that. But this dynamic between the text as a, you know, kind of an abstracted object that's put in this collection versus the text as a living historical social document uh, those things are always kind of intention. Uh, I just wanted to sort of put that out there before we uh, get into the details. Uh, if you're interested in m some uh, readings on that topic, Catherine Bode, who's based in Australia, has written a lot of uh, great work. Um, there's a, a, late, a 
citation of an article here, which is a good place to start, but she's done a lot of careful thinking about how, how one sort of situates one's uh, text collection, one's corpus, you know, in a, a larger social and historical context. So let's get to the collection itself. Um, what I have, what I, what you see here uh, is just a kind of a, a distribution of the text, the novels that we have, the novels that we've digitized by time period. So um, when we're searching through this uh, collection, you know, one of the things that clearly stands out is that really the, the most um, representative period uh, here is essentially from about 1940 to late 1970s. That's where most of the texts are coming from. Um, you can see that the top year, uh, is, I think that's 61, is about 17 works. Uh, before those periods, we get a few blips of, you know, a couple, two to three works, uh, all the way back to 1853 is the first work in the collection right now. Uh, and then there's a work from 2012. That's as far forward as it goes. Uh, as we digitize other novels, this, this, is, this distribution will change and fill out in other ways, but I, I just wanted to sort of present a sense of what we have now. Um, in terms of the authors, uh, there's 313 authors represented. What I'm showing you here are the top 50 authors just by the number of novels they have. Uh, Frank Yerby, who's, who's come up already uh, several times, he has the most in the collection, about 16 novels, uh, 16 or 17. Uh, Samuel Delaney is, is second. And then from there, it, it uh, sort of goes down. And it's uh, one of the things that's interesting about this corpus, and this is probably you know, a fact that it's made up of so many rare works, is that uh, by the time you get to the 50th most represented author, we're already at just two works. And everybody else after that only has one work in the corpus. So it really is a, a collection of you know, mostly kind of minor uh, writers in that sense. Um, but yeah, here you can sort of see, uh, you know, up at the top we have um, the authors I've already mentioned, uh, Griggs, who, was, who came up earlier, uh, Dubois, uh, Paul Dunbar, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but just to give you a sense of who, uh, who we have in the collection. Um, I'm gonna just jump past this because I'm a little worried about time, but uh, I'll, these slides are posted and you'll, you'll have access to them uh, later. But this is just some useful language. You know, when you think about what kind of corpus you want to build and how it might relate to a larger body of texts, uh, the, the field of content analysis can be really helpful. Um, different from a kind of statistical approach where you're, you know, maybe like if you were doing a survey of a population, you'd want to have representatives from every, you know, every member of that population, you want to have them equally represented. With text analysis, uh, oftentimes it's, it's a different kind of uh, thinking that goes into it, where really you're, you're interested in just creating the best corpus or the best sample that fits your research questions. And so I think that, uh, that's, that's one of the ways that I've found is really helpful to sort of, you know, it's not, you're not trying to represent everything and not trying to represent it in a statistical sense, but really your goal is to find the best set of texts that fit and that are gonna best answer the research questions you have. Um, and that's sort of, it's an iterative process to get to that point, but this is uh, just some helpful language to think about that. All right, let me uh, just spend a, uh, one more minute talking about sort of the tool I'm gonna introduce and put it in kind of relation to other tools that are out there and available for you. Um, so the first, I think that this is the, the, the tool that we're all very familiar with by now, which is the keyword search. It sort of underlies a lot of the, uh, any kind of archival work we do now. Um, it's great in that it gets you a lot of information at once, but it's also very imprecise. You get all the documents or none of them uh, based on a single presence of a single word. Um, and the relation of the text to its context or the word to its context is often eliminated. Um, I like to think of it as kind of just a vacuum cleaner, right? It sucks up everything, but oftentimes you get a lot of things you don't need uh, and it's hard to sort through it all. Um, so philologic is really a, a kind of an attempt, philologic is the tool that we, we're, we built here at Chicago, is an attempt to be, to provide a more precise instrument. Um, what, it, what it's good, at, good for is finding words in specific contexts. Um, it allows you to compare contexts easily. 
Uh, it's easy to zoom in and out between, you know, uh, individual words and whole documents or the whole, the whole collection. And then it also allows you to filter your search results by all, any of the metadata that we have available. Uh, so right now that metadata is limited, but as that grows, uh, you'll be able to search, you know, by gender or by um, publisher, publishing location, or any of the more kind of complex features that we add. Uh, so I think of it as both, it's both a microscope and a telescope. It allows you to zoom in very close and also see very far away and put those two things, uh, sort of visualize that relation very clearly. Um, just a, a couple of other tools that you might find useful uh, depending on where your research goes. Uh, Voyant is really great. It does some things that are similar to Philologic, uh, but it's very good for just focusing on one or a handful of texts. And it's all done through the browser. Um, you just simply need plain text and you can feed it to it and it gives you a lot of different information, uh, linguistic information about uh, a text. Um, Another one, which is a little bit more complicated, is called Ant uh, Conk, and this is developed by linguists. Uh, there's a great tutorial uh, online that you can uh, look into that. Um, but this is, is not quite an MRI scan, but it's a little bit more in, in, in contrast. You know, it's, it's, it's slightly more uh, uh, complicated and takes a little bit more time to get used to. But if, you know, if you're familiar with uh, this kind of work, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a great tutorial and you can use that to to do a little bit more um, sort of statistical analysis looking for lexical differences uh, between documents and, and whatnot. All right, uh, so here I'm, I wanna switch to use, uh, using the tool. Um, I'm gonna move away from the slides. Uh, so what I'd like you all to do is essentially uh, go to this link and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, see if I can paste it in the chat window. Uh, I can find that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, here we go. Is everybody uh, able to just put this into a web browser? Um, I was able to do it. Okay. Um, what you'll uh, see when you do that uh, is this page here. Um, I'm gonna expand this. Uh, I'm gonna pause, just make sure everybody's at the same point. Um, it's hard to know <laughs> since I can't hear you. Um, But uh, if you're here, um, once you've gotten here, then what you want to do is uh, click on this link, search the complete collection. Hold on. Uh, and once you're on that page, you may get uh, asked for a username and password. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this screen up here. This is uh, the username and password. Uh, I'm going to try to, for some reason, I'm going to stop sharing because I, I don't have access to the chat window. So I'm going to paste this in the chat window for a second uh, so you guys can all have it. So there, there is the link. And then uh, here is the username and password. Okay. If there's anyone who can't access it, if you could just write that down in the chat window, then I'll know that you're not being able to access it. If you can't say it out loud for some reason. So uh, hopefully uh, everybody can see this page. Um, is everybody here? Logged in? Okay. Uh, great. 
So what I'm going to do um, ahead, go ahead, is, is walk you guys through some of the basic features of the tool, and then uh, we'll do a little bit more kind of uh, advanced keyword searching. Um, but let me show you, let me sort of walk you through the interface. It's fairly straightforward. It's meant to be, you know, very intuitive. Uh, on this home page, you can essentially, you know, if you're looking for a particular um, author or title, you can access that through these um, through these bars, these uh, bars here. So uh, this will give you just simply the authors in alphabetical order. Uh, you can also look at all the titles. Uh, and if you were to click on one of those, it would take you to the text as we have it in the database. But more often than not, you're going to be, you know, searching through the collection. Uh, and the way you do that is just go up to the search window. Uh, and I'm going to be using some keywords that I thought might be interesting given all of your, uh, your research interests. Uh, somebody talked about, you know, looking at sort of representations of Paris. Uh, Cuba, I guess, is another place. But I'm going to put in Paris, and you can see that it comes up with other terms that are in the, the collection. Uh, it autofills those um, in case, you know, so you can see what search terms are actually there. I'm going to click on Paris, and then I'm going to click on the little magnifying glass, and that's going to take me to this next page. So, what you'll see here is that the Paris shows up in this, these, these, these texts uh, about 1,500 times. Uh, and Philologic, you know, it's really intended to sort of keep the text uh, there and present. And so what you have here are essentially the context in which Paris is found in all of our, in, in all of those 1,500 uh, passages. Of course, you don't want to look through all, maybe you don't want to look through all 1,500 of those. So uh, the next thing that you can do uh, is go over here to this browse by facet uh, box, and you can actually then narrow down by title or author. So for example, I'm going to click on author here. And that's going to tell me, you know, in, term, in absolute terms, so the, the raw count, which author uses this term the most in our collection. So Frank Yerby, we know there's a lot of his texts in there. So actually, but he, he references Paris quite a bit, 200 times. Uh, and then we can go on down. Um, so this absolute frequency is just the raw number. It doesn't, it's not relative to anything uh, like how much of an author's, you know, uh, materials in the collection. If you're interested in, in that and you want to see, you know, who really uses Paris the most given how many, you know, how many texts they have, you can click on this button, relative frequency. So go ahead and click on that. Um, and what you see here is that uh, actually in terms of, you know, the number of words in the collection, this, this author, John Henry Painter, uses it the most. Uh, if you click on that name, that will actually take you to all 46 of those hits. Uh, and so now we can see that most of them appear to be coming from a one document called 50 Years After, uh, where I, I, I don't know the document, but where Paris is, is, is talked about uh, quite frequently. And uh, once you've found this, if you, for, if for instance, you want to go in and actually explore the document, you can go ahead and do that. Um, by uh, clicking on the document body link. So if you go ahead and click on that, it takes you right to that section in the text where you can see that occurrence of Paris. Uh, and this is really just a way to get you back to the original text if you want to see what's happening around um, that passage. All right. Um, Okay, so that's just really the, the simple introduction to the keyword search, and uh, hopefully you guys will spend a lot of time sort of playing around with that. Uh, I want to introduce some of the other features. Uh, so if you go to this top of the page uh, and go ahead and click on the KWIC tab, quick. And once you've clicked on that, go ahead and click the magnifying glass again. 
and notice that we're still searching just within uh, John Henry Painter's novel, or just within his novels. I'm going to go ahead and cross him out so that now we're searching in everything. Uh, and keyword in context is really just a different way to display the information that we saw earlier. It's, it's a narrower vision to uh, perhaps you have some questions about how a word is used in its uh, context, whether there are, some, there are some particular grammatical or semantic relations you're interested in. This is a way to look at that. Um, and you can actually uh, sort the results by the words on the left or right side. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that here. You say it says resort results by, if you click on none and say words to the left. No. Um, you can see uh, now that everything on the left of Paris starts with ah, uh, and you can sort of go through those. And uh, and this is really useful if you, if you're if there's a particular kind of syntactic or grammatical relationship you want to explore. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, uh, you, I'll let you play around with that some more on your, on your own time, but just to, know, just to, to let you know that, that that's another kind of tool that we can use. I think some of the most interesting stuff, though, comes from uh, the collocation uh, tab. So if you could click on the collocation tab at the top, and let's switch the search term. I'm going to uh, actually put the term uh, just Y-O in. Um, and it'll be, it'll be immediately clear why I would do that uh, after the search. If you go ahead and click the magnifying glass, um, what collocation is, is it basically goes through and looks, you know, for every occurrence of those two letters, Y-O, it's going to look within the same sentence and say, and get all of those words, and then tell you which words most often occur in the same sentence as that word. Uh, as you notice, what it's basically found us are passages of vernacular. Uh, you know, uh, the, that, uh, get, ain't, ah, uh, with. Um, if, if you were to click on one of these, uh, let's click on the, the top one, uh, the. You're immediately presented with uh, instances of, of vernacular and dialect. Um, in this case, uh, a work by Charles Chestnut. Uh, what it's found are every sentence where yo and uh, the, the appear together. Um, and so this is a, I mean, this is a really kind of amazing way to, to sort of find words, uh, find sort of words at, and their semantic, uh, inspect their sort of semantic relationships. Um, I know uh, from another um, one of your applications, I think rage was a term that was of interest. So I'm going to search that uh, in the collocation. Um, there's about a thousand occurrences of rage, and it's perhaps interesting uh, that most of the things that occur with rage are related to, um, uh, the, the, first of all, the face, the eyes, and the voice. Um, and what you can then do is, you know, looking at these results, go ahead and, and try to maybe, maybe you have a particular intuition or a particular argument you want to make about the use of, of rage or anger or those terms, you can then kind of go in, uh, let's look at voice, for instance, um, and you'll find um, every instance in the collection where those two words appear in the same sentence. Um, I'll, I'll explain in a moment, uh, let me make sure we're okay on time, yeah. Um, I'll explain in a moment how you can sort of uh, even uh, find even more precise uh, relationships between two words. But let me just show you the very last uh, feature of the logic. <coughs> go ahead and go to the top and click on time series. And let me, I'm going to put in the term body, uh, that was also a term of of interest. So if you click on time series and let's do body and click on the magnifying glass, uh, time series just because we have the public, the original publication dates, we can look at the, uh, the frequency over time. Uh, when you first occur on it, click on it, it's going to be absolute frequency. So you'll notice that the 
the bars go up precisely where our collection is most is is largest uh, because there are just more novels from these periods. So this doesn't actually tell you a lot about how body is being used, you know, relative to a, a period, a, a time period. Uh, for that, you want to click on relative frequency up here. And here you can see that actually relative to the amount of text per decade, body is used fairly uh, consistently across. <coughs> and you can uh, go ahead, you know, if you want to click on any one of these bars, let's, let's click on, I don't know, uh, 1913. So this is the decade from 13 to 23. Once you click on that, you've automatically now narrowed your search to just text published in those years where body occurs. Uh, and so in this way, you can kind of move, uh, you know, move back and forth between the collection as a whole and uh, a narrower view of that collection. Uh, let me pause here. Uh, there's just a, uh, I have a, just about five more minutes of material to cover, but uh, is everybody okay? Feeling good about things? Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat window. So, okay. All right, take, take care. Um, let me uh, move on to a few more items uh, and then uh, I'll wrap it up. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, go to the, uh, the, the opening page again. You can always go back to the, the, the home page by clicking on the, the title at the top. Um, and if you, uh, if you look next to the search window, there's a button that says show search option. Go ahead and click on that. Um, and what that's going to show you are a little bit more advanced search features. So I just want to run through these because I think they're, they might be useful to you all. Um, the one thing uh, to do that, that you can do is actually just search here. Uh, you can search the metadata if there's a particular text or author you're interested in. Uh, you can limit that. Our metadata categories, metadata categories aren't that rich right now, so this isn't all that useful. Um, but just so you know that that's, that's there. Uh, one, of the other, one of the things you can do that's quite interesting uh, is do a approximate search or approximate match. So I'm going to click, I'm going to put in the term something uh, in the window and I'm going to click on approximate match and it's going to say how approximate, I'm going to go ahead and start at 80%. And what this is going to do, it's going to do a kind of a fuzzy matching. So it's going to try to find terms that are spelled like something or very close to it. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of terms that come up. Uh, some of these are not actually what we are interested in. Uh, but I think one of the things that became clear to me as I was doing this search is that there's a lot of variance in spelling. So there may be a term you're looking for, but actually it's gonna appear in a, different, a number of different ways. This is one way to find some of those variants. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna change the accuracy to 90%, and that's gonna get me a little bit smaller a window. Uh, but here now you can see that we have some spellings, uh, something or something, uh, something. Uh, so in this way, now uh, there's probably better words to do this, but this is a way to kind of uh, make sure that you're finding all the relevant terms uh, you're interested in. The, uh, the next thing uh, I'll show you, we've already kind of encountered this with the collocations, but uh, if you want to search for two words in the same sentence, you just put them in the search bar with a space between them. Uh, so let's do, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my, uh, I'm going to turn off approximate match. Uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, I'm just going to look for the, the words white, uh, black in the same sentence. Uh, and when you just put a space in between them, that basically gets you every sentence where those two words appear. Uh, and just like, uh, we saw this with the collocations. Um, now let's say this is still too many hits or you want to do a narrower search. You can actually now uh, go to show search options, search options. 
And you can narrow it down. You can say, I want to just do five words. They have to be within five words of each other. Um, uh, and if you hit search again, oops, I'm going to say, uh, click on exactly five words. Yeah, you have to hit, sorry, you have to hit, uh, press on the exactly button there. Uh, but you can see now the number of hits have gone down. Uh, and here now we're just finding uh, passages where the two words appear within those, that number of words. So uh, maybe you want to, maybe if you have too many hits, you want to sort of narrow it down. This is the way to do that. Um, and all of these, all of these searches uh, all, there are explained in the PowerPoint. So don't worry about uh, if you forget them. That's all, you can, all, you can go back to the PowerPoint. Um, two more items I want to show you. Uh, you can also search for, um, you can do an or search. So let's say you want to work, search for two words that are in any, any document. Um, what you use is this, it's called the pipe operator. Uh, it's just should be just above your return key. It's kind of just a, a horizontal bar. Uh, and you can see if I put those, if I put those two terms in, um, I'm actually going to eliminate the, the exactly five words. Thing. Uh, now, now I'm just finding every document that has either the word white or black in it. So this is obviously going to be much more. Um, but if you want to expand your search and do two words at the same time, you have to use that, that operator. Um, and the last thing I'll show you, uh, if you want to work, search for a particular word, but not another word in a sentence. You use all capitals uh, not. Uh, and that will get you basically every sentence where one word appears, but not the other. Uh, and this, you know, you know, based on whatever you're, you're looking for, that might be helpful to eliminate certain sentences. All right. Uh, there's uh, there's a, a lot more that one can do with this. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail here, but if you hit this little question mark next to the search bar, you'll see a lot more instructions for more complicated types of searching uh, if that's uh, something you're interested in doing. Uh, but just so you know, that's there. And um, I think I've covered everything for the t that tool. Let me... Uh, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint um, come here. Okay. Just a few more, just a few concluding points. Uh, basically, you know, where do you go from here? You have now you've been introduced to this and hopefully you'll have a lot more time you, know, you can spend on your own to sort of explore the corpus. The thing that I think Philologic is good for, you know, it's really meant as a discovery tool. And it's also good for developing hypotheses uh, about how particular words or semantic relations, uh, semantic patterns, grammatical patterns might be working in these documents. It really helps you identify a set of texts uh, or authors or even passages that you want to then go in and do close reading of. Uh, it can really narrow, in, narrow down you know, the kinds of things you're working with, uh, but in a way that's much more sophisticated than just keyword search. And then it helps you develop hunches about lexical patterns or words use, word use. And then you can take those hunches and hopefully you know, develop them into uh, more um, either you know, uh, close readings or, you know, uh, or something of that nature, or you can you know, use, them, use these hunches to develop uh, further kind of analytic um, projects. So, uh, you know, as you move to analysis, some things you might think of, this is just very general, but, you know, identifying semantic patterns around specific keywords with the collocations tool, for instance, uh, detecting and comparing vernacular styles, identifying changes in semantic patterns over time or by genre, um, or kind of cross-corpus comparison with other bodies of fiction. And I'll show you in a moment a, a comparison corpus that might be useful for that. So um, these are just a few sort of starting points that you might think about uh, that might, add, might supplement some of the kinds of projects you all are, are interested in. 
From here, there's much more complicated methods and, and tools, and I think some of those will be introduced later on. Um, but you know, many of us, uh, the consultants, would be happy to help you sort of explore some of these tools, depending on where your research goes. Uh, you know, whether it's analyzing more sophisticated linguistic patterns, looking for distribution of topics and themes, um, comparing different documents by word use, or even classifying works, you know, according to some stylistic or generic features. Uh, these are all things that can now be done, um, but just require a lot, you know, uh, more sort of um, more work to, to accomplish. And finally, um, I'll put up here three more links. These are all textual optics labs collections that I thought some of you might be interested in. The first two are essentially from, uh, you know, Alexander Street Press. Uh, the, the lab here has had a longstanding relationship with them. The first one uh, is 1,200 plays from mid 19th century to the modern era. The second one is a general uh, black writing and thought collection, which is about 22,000 texts from the 1700s to the modern era. And all of these use the same search interface I've just introduced to you. So go ahead, uh, please explore those. See if there's things, documents in it that, are, that are relevant. Uh, and then the final one is a, a corpus of, of 9,000 American novels um, published in the last you know, 120 years. Uh, that we've developed here. And this is mostly, uh, you know, it's a majority of uh, white authors, but if you're looking for kind of uh, novels to compare um, the BFIP corpus with, this is a, a great place to start. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop there. Uh, and thank you all for listening. I hope it hasn't gone on too long and I look forward to your questions and um, I hope you're excited to have access to this, uh, this, this collection through this uh, amazing search tool. Thanks. So thank you, Hoy. Um, I think what what I what you can see is one, uh, what's interesting, but curious, but also how you can forecast, uh, looking ahead for some things you didn't think you might be interested in, but what the possibilities uh, for um, philologic allows you to do. Uh, secondly, I think it's also we have this one database that we built and the accompanying interface, but you also see a model creating your own databases, smaller perhaps than the one we are working on, but you get a model for how to do it and how to make it accessible and how people can work with it. So clearly you'll have time to play around with this and I literally, literally mean play. You have to play with it a little bit to see how you get, how comfortable you get with it and look up some things the first time we, it came to our office, um, Morgan was in the office, he was interested in knowing uh, how much violence was in late 19th century texts. And so she entered that word and was really surprised to see the, the, the number of texts that pointed to um, violence in a period where uh, clearly it was, it was significant, but books that she never heard of before. Because this, as, as Hoyt has said, we've been concentrating on lesser known texts. So you won't see all of Toni Morrison's books in here. You won't see all of Richard Wright's books in here. But you will see Frank Irby's books in here. A lot of people do know him, but most people don't. So we're trying to bring a larger core of text to the discussions that you might be having and are curious about. Uh, I guess the third thing I'd say is that comparative capacity here, to do comparative research. Uh, so that if you do have multiple uh, databases that you're looking at in archives, data, digital archives, you can make some kinds of comparisons. And Philologic might not be ready to do that now, but at some point it might be. It might do that kind of cross-platform work. But anyway, uh, those are kind of, anybody want to want to share some thoughts about this? Um, any comments? I, I have one. Okay. I, well, I just have one question for Hoyt or for yeah. Arnav or anybody here, mm -hmm. and that's just, I wonder if, if you want to say anything about um, uh, copyright issues okay. and how, how we yes. how we can and what any restrictions on accessing the material or how we might use it yes um, and maybe in terms so, of export so we did anticipate that everybody hear me we did anticipate this issue uh, Sarah's smiling up there on the screen because she is actually as we speak uh, putting together a document that we would ask you to sign because as you know um, one of the reasons why DH work and the, the DH are archives uh, and digital archives generally are not as plentiful 
for, 19, for 20th and 21st century work is the copyright issue. So people working in Chaucer studies or uh, early modern or Shakespeare will have access to limitless materials, but we have to be very careful. So while we want to encourage use of this database we've created, we have to also be careful about copyright issues. So while we're doing this research for this project, we will ask you to complete an agreement uh, that says you're not going to be sharing this with everybody widely. You're doing it primarily for research purposes. And uh, we'll, we'll be working with, with a legal team to talk about how to, how to uh, solve some of those larger questions about copyright. In the grant we have to write, you actually had to have a statement about how to guard against copyright infringement. So that was actually in the grant proposal. So this is a, a big issue. And it does present some limitations. But I think what people in the past have done is allow those limitations to just uh, eliminate the possibility of doing this kind of research because it's too much, it's too problematic. Uh, but you will have access to this archive. Um, and as I said, to the extent that you need more text, more access to the fuller text, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But you will, you will get a document soon uh, uh, outlining the way we see doing this. Um, uh, Hoyt, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just add that the copyright limitations extend to the, all of the, the collections I just introduced to you. Um, yes. And so, right. we, you know, I, I really, it's a really a, a fine line, but I, because you, all of you are involved in this project, I want to make sure you have access to all the resources that we have. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah, you can't, we, we can't circulate the text sort of beyond the philologic interface, but at the very least, uh, this is a starting point, um, and we're we're trying to make as many uh, publicly available as we can. So, if you notice on the opening page, we, we have kind of a public site where you can search the pre the in, the out of copyright materials, and right. then the, the mm -hmm. private site where you can the password site where you can search everything. So, you guys have the password to that now, um, and so, uh, but yeah, the, the copyright issues extend to pretty much everything. And we all you're talking about text after 1923. Yes, that's right. That's what we're talking about. Just that's where we're at now, yeah. Yeah, so text after, published after 1923. This is where this copyright issue applies. So thank you for that question. Um, where are we now? Um, so we had initially planned on having a general discussion amongst okay. the applicants where they could talk about their projects. Okay. Um, I don't know how we are doing for time, but we can definitely get started on that idea. So I would suggest that if what you just saw, the demonstration of the uh, functionality of the uh, philologic uh, interface, did anything click for you? Any thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, something pop into your head as you were watching how it might be used? Uh, I know some of us have used Voya, which is, which we, we've been, you know, uh, was I actually have a question. So good, thank you. I have a question. So Hoy, first, thanks so much for the uh, demonstration on how to use the tool. Even though we cannot work with the actual text, is there a way to export the metadata from, uh, let's say, for instance, from a concurrence or a word analysis or anything like that? Can we export the metadata to um, maybe build a visualization from it? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now you can export it. Uh, I didn't show you on the, the site, but there's a, after every search, there's a little kind of button on the right that says export to a JSON file, JSON file. Um, so you can do that and it basically gives you uh, the data in that format. Um, we're trying to work to, to sort of make it so that that's not a format that many folks are used to working with, but if you have somebody who can convert that data to a CSV or other kind of database uh, language, uh, it's all there, so it's it's uh, so exporting is easy. It's just what to do with it afterward that requires a few more steps. Um, uh, but I can talk to our developers here if if uh, folks want some instructions on how best to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Other questions, comments, reflections. Like I said, let's fold this into uh, what you see might be possible related to the interest that you brought. Uh, with your application, introduced to us in your application, or uh, questions that come as a result of seeing this. Oh, 
okay, so just just to be clear, so for philologic, that is that is kind of a um, we will not be contributing to that particular database for our projects. It's more of a consultation site for the projects that will be that will commence on our, our individual ends. So the philologic interface is the access to our database that we are still growing. Okay. We have something novels in it now. We are going to obviously expand that. We're still adding metadata. So it will be your way of interacting with the current database that we have for the Afro-American Novel Project. And I'm going back to that original older name. So that's okay. the database. Uh, extent to which you want to do work, and we hope you will, of, around those 1,200 novels or questions, you can actively, yes, you will be using that interface, but no, you won't have to contribute to the actual interface. Now let okay. me say one, one um, caution here. We have been asking everyone if they have collections of novels we don't know exist. Mm -hmm. That's how HBW started. It's like we went around literally in people's attics and basements and house sales to see yes. what books were being um, thrown away. I mean, I just came back from the Zora Festival in Florida and the story there is they were burning Hurston's papers and somebody, the sheriff from the University of someplace in Gainesville said, no, 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 this is a Florida resident. We need to save her work. So mm -hmm. in archive are charred papers mm -hmm. that they saved from the fire. Yes. So if you, you know, that's a rather extreme example, but on the other hand, not so extreme because collections and papers get burned all the time. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you know of a collection that hasn't been processed and you think there might be some gems in those collections, let us know because if, it's if there are novels in particular, we want to make sure we don't, we do not have them already in our archive. So we're all always looking for something that, you know, we're making recover, we're looking for recovered work or le lesser known work. So you can contribute in that way, letting us know, hey, there's a collection of Bethune Cookman that people don't know about and nobody had a chance to process it. Uh, and so check, your, check it against your database. Um, so th that piece. Would be, I, yeah, can I add something? Yeah, please. So, a little something that I'd like to add is that there are currently around 450 novels which uh, Philologic works with. And like, uh, like we said earlier, earlier, we have a total of around 1,250. Now, me, Hamza, and Robin, who is not here right now, we are working on finishing the metadata for all 1,250. Now, obviously, we haven't been able to finish all 52 categories that we identified. But we have, uh, we will finish uh, the whole metadata based on at least some of them, uh, primarily among them, like author gender, genre, theme, and location of action in the novel. Um, so we are, we are trying to finish that by the middle of next week. So at the very least, you will have um, a limited set of metadata for all 1,250 novels that we'll be sending out your way, hopefully by next week. So, so keep in mind the word dynamic. <laughs> we, we mentioned that earlier, that we're, these are, we're all works in process, uh, works in progress, and we will be adding to the database, adding metadata, uh, and we are also developing new ways of thinking about metadata. But uh, so all this is happening simultaneously. The choice we had was to not bring you in until everything was finished or bring people in now and help shape the process. And so I think your ability to contribute to the process as we're moving through it is much more valuable than our doing it and putting and using our heads to try to shape it and then say, come and let us know what you think. We want a more dynamic process as we are going forward. But so those two questions. Other comments, questions? Other comments and questions? Thoughts, light bulb moments. <laughs> I'll just say that um, as I was uh, playing around with it, this is Saritha, um, that I was thinking about a project that I, I did in Buoyant, which yeah. was uh, not very successful, but I, if I had Philologic, it probably would have been a little bit more successful. So okay. I had some students and they were interested in finding um, 
similes and metaphors in African American writing. And so we had digitized some text and we uploaded it into Voyant and I mean, we were able to do some stuff, but it, it was so difficult. It was really so cumbersome because you couldn't see enough of that data, like enough of the text to like figure out what was going on. And so I just, I, I like this, the, the platform, it seems, you know, very accessible and I would probably enjoy using this a lot more as a tool than I did in Voyant. So I just, that was a, a light bulb moment for me. And so I've been playing around with, you know, what can I do? And then, you know, which authors have like more uh, as or like words in there, you know, just kind of fooling around with it. So it's pretty cool. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. This is the best Friday ever. <laughs> Right Thanks, <laughs> As I said, we have, I mean, we have advisors, we have people who are willing to assist you and some travel money. So if somebody has to actually come physically to your site to show you how things are done, we want to be able to, to meet your needs and expand your capacity to do this work and to build, uh, you know, several of you are already in, 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 uh, in teams. Uh, this is the essence of collaboration and teamwork. So we hope that those of you are, who have individual projects might team together with other people who are here now, but also expand your teams because we want as many people to, to understand the value of what we can do, the kind of research that you can do as possible. So, but thank you for your light bulb moment, Sarita. Any other questions, thoughts, um, concerns? How does this how does this translate into a project that you brought with your to your application? How does this translate for you? So I'm I'm gonna get to my teacher mode now. Uh, Taisha, uh, James Baldwin, Pam. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Okay, so you've been doing this work on Paris and James Baldwin forever and ever. Right. Mm -hmm. So how does this, how does this thought, and since he used the word Paris, uh, you, uh, Hoyt used that as one of his examples, how would this interest you in terms of thinking a little bit beyond Baldwin? Well, you know, I already do work, I, when um, Hoyt was searching, I searched the year 1957 because 1957 was one of the years. Um, because I'm interested in Paris post-1960, but 1957 was the year that the Algerian, French Algerian War um, started. So I was looking at that date and looking up um, what came up during that search and if anything was relevant to tensions in Paris because of the, the year. And so that was something that came up for me, like, okay, let me come back to it over the weekend and just see what, which, you know, what the data is saying. Um, but then there were several years after 1960 that I didn't get to search just because we had gone on to something else and I wanted to make sure that I understood what was coming next. But that was something that um, struck me. Yeah. So hopefully this will make your work easier. Right. It gives you the, the, the data that you need, the text that you never think about looking at. Because uh, one of the interesting developments for us at HBW in the early years is that we did an early survey and discovered that most people teach just a handful of texts. Mm. They teach the same text over and over again. Therefore, the crit and, and, and you get the, the paper trail. The people write about those texts. Those texts get reprinted most frequently. They get anthologized more frequently. But we don't know, and therefore, the assumption that people make is that this is the canon. And I always like to tell people that the project, I am old enough to remember when I was in undergraduate school, the professor that I was taking the class from said to me, there was no black literature before 1940, and it was Richard Wright's native son. And I came from Augusta, Georgia, and I knew that Frank Yerby was a black writer. Most people didn't, but I did. I thought, no, that's not true. But who was I to challenge my teacher? As an undergrad. So that was always in the back of my mind when I began my interest, actively interested in, in, in a black fiction and black, the black novel. But it was really, what do we teach? <coughs> how, how, what a small body of work that we you base our analysis, understanding, discussions of literature on. Very small. And so- Dr. Open, might I add something, please? 
Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Taisha, uh, I think one of the things that I think is really cool about her project is that she focuses on Baldwin. And I think one of the more useful things that she could do, even particularly with this digital tool, is consider what makes Baldwin Baldwin. So, for instance, let's just say focusing on certain types of words, for instance. What types of verbs does Baldwin use? But what does that mean in comparison to the actual database that we have? So I guess I think one of the biggest things I would like scholars to at least especially take away from this is be in a discovery phase for a little bit. Um, ask what type of questions you can ask about words, about words uh, uh, that mean similar things, because that's one of the things that I think will be the, um, how this will benefit Taisha's project working with Baldwin, we get to see exactly what is precise, I mean, uh, what precise things about Baldwin's language make him stand out from the majority of Black authors in the camp, I mean, in the corpus that we developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll add one more point to that because my class on mass incarceration narratives that I'm teaching for the first time, uh, we were, we just read in Beale Street, through the Southern film, read the book. And the language in that book is just so powerful. So we had a full discussion about what draws us to Baldwin, what draws us. And of course, we know that this is the first person narrative is Tish telling a story. Uh, and uh, and Bonnie's in jail, and so, but students were in. Were, they, they hadn't read a 1974 novel by a black writer, so it was a, it was a, it was an, an aha moment to to get into that text in a way uh, that they that otherwise. So I'm now thinking I need to look at Baldwin again and, and go because I, I I I they were hooked in a sense because they read the text, we read some passages out loud. But again, this allows me to to to, to draw more to the table, bring more to the table. And I think peak students' interests, and they're not all in English majors, by the way. They're not. I'd say maybe one third of them are. But they're interested because the subject is mass incarceration. And I'm ch choosing texts that take that take on that theme. So. Okay, can I ask a question? I, I'm just slow kid at the back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. I join you. <laughs> so I um, recently haven't done some work on uh, Jungle Alley for uh, this Holland Renaissance Encyclopedia. I noticed the word clam got tossed around in word reference to the lesbians uh, during the Holland Renaissance. So I was interested in word and language words and languages that got used during that time mm -hmm. that we would not recognize at this time, because we were said either same gender loving in the black community with some of us and gay and lesbian, is there a way to go back and look at research in a way that words can be reintroduced back in that would not be as explicit, not even using the term homosexual, because clam was a code word mm -hmm. used on Jungle Alley to not get in trouble with the police. Mm -hmm. But everybody who was in that area of Harlem, they knew what it meant. They knew where to go. They knew what the drag shows were. They knew what the same sex things were going on. Uh, the public displays of sex and stuff like that, but they kept the police side of it. Is there a way to look back and do research on those areas where people want to go back and see how things were looked at in the past, as opposed to how we're looking at them now, especially within the Black community because we're not using the same terms. Mm -hmm. So research would get overlooked. Black people would be overlooked. Uh, people in drag, people like Gladys Bentley in those places would be overlooked and the research that so there's going to be this huge silence and gap around it. That's my concern, not only as a librarian, but as a writer. Okay. Okay. Questions? Synonyms or other words that stand for other words, other coded language. How do we get something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really great question and a tough one, right? Because it's, it, you know, it goes against the whole, the very kind of epistemology, the, the idea of the keyword search. <laughs> If you don't know what that keyword is, but I think, I mean, just just off the top of my head, one way that you might get at it through this particular tool is to use that collocation feature, but search for tools that you that like everyday terms or other terms that you might expect not to change so much, or maybe those hold you know those remain consistent throughout time, but whereas you know the kinds of uh, the key terms that you're looking for may show up around those. So whether it's you know I don't know uh, you know various places uh, where you might expect that term to show up, you know, reference to specific types of uh, restaurants or bars or locations in a city, like maybe you search for those terms first and then kind of by there, by that means triangulate and come up with the, and maybe discover some of these terms that we don't know. Interesting. So this would definitely be a discovery project. Mm. You'd have to discover the terms themselves mm -hmm. by looking at context, place, 
um, and see how fre the frequency of the, those occurrences, and then and then and then uh, deepen your analysis based on that. So it would be multiple steps. It seems to me you have to do multiple steps. But you don't. You're not going to know it right off the bat. You have to find it. So this is definitely a discovery project. Any other thoughts on that? Can you add something to that? Yeah. Oh, uh, let me let me do two introductions. Actually, Hamza has joined us. Who is on the team on the ground here at KU? And I think Howard, are you still with us? I think I see your name. Howard Ramsey is another one of our advisors who, who stepped in at some point as well. So thank you. Yeah, just like springboarding off of what Con Conrad's comment was, uh, the metadata sheet that we are preparing and we are going to be introducing 1200 novels. A lot of them are specifying the genre of each title. And uh, for instance, so by just going through this list, we will know what books, what titles are dealing with speculative uh, uh, fiction issues, yeah. or which of these titles are uh, relevant to LGBT issues. Uh, because we, we, we go through the texts and we see and we try to categorize where these titles might be placed. And we also do an online search. Of course, many of these texts are do not have an online presence because as Dr. Grant said earlier, Many of these texts are being brought online for the very first time uh, because they're not a part of the canon. And I came across texts like that. So they are going to have an online presence for the very first time in history. And going through the text, when we start reading the plot and we start reading the characters, we find out that this book actually is broaching on LGBT issues or this book is actually broaching on horror issues. So we have categorized those titles under, under those genres, under those uh, themes in the metadata sheet that we are providing to you. And, <clears throat> and that may be one way to kind of do research if you're thinking of those titles that are not using traditional terminology that one would use to categorize it under LGBT, but because we read through the book and we know that these are issues that are being talked about in the book, uh, they can still be placed under it and then therefore expand your research that way. I don't know if that really helps. I just felt like that's something that might be relevant and to your uh, just to kind of piggyback off from that um since it's impossible for us to like leave alone close read even read individual novels when we're gathering the metadata on mm -hmm. them uh something that's been really useful for um, me personally i'm sure it's been for hamza and robin as well is that most of the information we've found about stuff like where the location of uh, the action is taking place in the book or uh, the theme of the book, or even how the reception of the book was, at are, are, are the book reviews, uh, which we get in online databases like ProQuest, ProQuest, uh, JSTOR, even Google Books has scans of older issues of crisis and yet mm -hmm. where uh, you get book reviews. And I personally have been going through individual reviews and you get a lot of essential information there. So, um, um, to just to answer your question about uh, the reception of certain words, if I didn't, if, if, I, if, I, if I'm uh, reading you right, um, the reception of certain words, there's some very valuable information to be had mm -hmm. from those reviews, and we're trying to incorporate that into the metadata sheet. So that might be really helpful once we manage to get that across through to your way. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But this discussion alone is extremely helpful because we are refining the metadata all the time. We're refining, we're trying to figure out how you get answers to the questions, what are the questions you ask, and how do you decode that information. So it helps to have these kind of dialogues. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also, uh, just in, in a comic moment, say that at HBW, we have a phrase that once you join us, we're like the mafia, you can't <laughs> leave, because there's always new stuff happening and new things that you're learning that you can put back into the pot to discover. And so perhaps that's what happens here. You just have to keep going, keep staying, because the information you ask today may be available three months from now because of the metadata work that we've just, you know, we've just coded. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody want to jump in here? Some other thoughts you might have been playing around as we were, as we were uh, going through the um, discussion? Um, one thing I'd just like to add that I just, it just was kind of like a, a light bulb that uh, went off when you were talking about how we can expand the canon um, and just including uh, texts that we hadn't really uh, 
considered in our teaching, you know, in the way that we're researching. Um, and I just think that that's such an extraordinary opportunity and such fertile ground for us to really, um, you know, broaden the spectrum of how we read African American literature, um, you know, and we introduce, you know, black literature. So it, it just inspired me and it's really got my, you know, juices flowing and I'm, I'm just really thinking about that idea. So I, I just wanted to add that. Great. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I mean, I think that something I learned from um, the institutes that we ran with high school teachers years ago is that the pairing of texts, mm -hmm. one of the ways that they often introduced texts they wanted to, to have their students read, but which the school system had not necessarily approved, was by pairing texts. So they would have a quote, canonical text alongside a lesser known, a non-canonical text, and getting people to talk about those things, and that way exposing students to many more works. So I think that sometimes we will be obviously thinking about canonical texts, but but what this does is to show you other texts that were doing some of the same kinds of things, but that nobody read, nobody discussed. And while Arthur is correct, we can look at the review, reviewing literature, the peer review, but some texts do not have those reviews. So we will be the first pre people in here in 2019 reading and providing reviews of texts that were written, you know, uh, years, uh, decades ago that nobody saw or heard beyond a very few people, but nobody decided to have a written review of it. So we know that that's also the case. So that clearly we have to do some close reading. And so that piece of that uh, Hoyt mentioned might be very useful in terms of how, at some point we got to do that. We can find information, but we also have to do some post reading. I need to interrupt um, so we can oh. be respectful of everybody's time today. Um, it's 3.01. I'm the timekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything you want to add, Dr. Graham, before we well, wrap up? I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know you, a lot of stuff is rolling around in your mind, and I hope you will take the opportunity to, to, to put those things down. Uh, you know, in notes to us because we want to benefit from all the dialogue, whether it comes forth right now or whether it comes after the fact or, you know, it keeps you awake at night. With whatever it does, we want to, to hear that. And thank you again for joining us and for being our, our first uh, experimental team of BPIP scholars that we would like to continue to, uh, to add new groups to this, but you're the first group, so you know it matters a lot. Uh, and so all that you're thinking and maybe not sharing at the moment, we know is valuable. And so we look forward to hearing it. Um, a lot more to come, but please give us feedback. We really need your feedback. So um, before we all leave, um, Sarah, the next session is on 22nd of March, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, also at 1 p.m. All the sessions will be on Fridays at 1 p.m. Central Time. I will send out, I'm sure you're gonna get way more emails for me than you would like, um, especially here um, at the beginning as, as we get rolling. Um, but yes, I'll, I'll send out reminders ahead of time um, and I'll have some more information for you um, next week, I hope. Hopefully that um, agreement that um, was mentioned earlier um, and those of you that haven't submitted your uh, paperwork to get your um, stipend, please do so as soon as you can. Um, I know you want your money. I can't pay you until you <laughs> send in your paperwork. And also I need your photo and your bio. Um, we wanna put that on our website. If you go to our website now, uh, um, the consultant bios are all up there. So those are the folks that are available to work with you on your projects. Um, you may wanna look through and if there's anybody in particular that you'd like to work with, um, let us know. Um, otherwise we're gonna be working um, the next few weeks to um, sort of identify good pairings in terms of what consultant makes the most sense with a particular project um, in your research interests, that kind of thing. I'm happy to answer any questions you have as we go along. Um, please just email. That's all I have. So the money you get, remember we are going to meet in person at CLA, so don't tarry in making your reservation because the cutoff dates do come and then the price goes up. So I've seen the hotels, nice, spacious place. Uh, but um, so when when that when that comes through, please don't hesitate to do that. 
I want to thank everybody again, the people around the table, the people who chimed in, and those uh, who, um, you know, who will be looking at. You will have a copy of this to mull over. You're going to get a copy of it. So seeing it again, maybe will strike some more thoughts in your mind. But everybody will have a copy. We make you're recording everything, so you can study at your own leisure. Thank you, everybody. Okay. See ya. Have Thank you. Good Hope you don't have as much snow as we do on this end. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you all soon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.